great pleasure for me to introduce Katerina Akasaglu. I have known Katerina since 2003 when I actually hired her at UCSD. She was my first faculty hire and I, I wouldn't uh, say my best because that would make others not feel so good, but she was a wonderful hire. She actually was a, a, um, worked with on an, in an area and with people that none of us really knew, uh, but she just like stood out amongst the applicants for her creativity and her passion and her technical prowess. And it was just kind of the wow factor that made us say, she's the one we need. And uh, we weren't disappointed, um, except for the fact that she left some years later for uh, a, a terrific opportunity at Gladstone, um, where she has uh, been more recently. Um, while she was at UCSD, she established a, a wide group of admirers and collaborators. She published with Roger Chen and with Michael Karen and um, quite a lot with um, Mark Ellisman, who she continues to, to work with. And then at UCSF, she's been again engaged with a wide swath of people and got much more involved in translational studies and um, even uh, forming a, a company and moving into a position of leadership there. So Katerina obtained her uh, BS and PhD in, in Athens in the area of neuroimmunology. And then she did, uh, and there she discovered that TNF alpha uh, expression in astrocytes drives inflammatory demyelination and was involved in the development of multiple sclerosis, which is a neurodegenerative disease that she's studied um, quite a bit. She did postdoctoral work at Rockefeller for a pretty short time before she applied uh, for this position. She told me that she was, I didn't realize that she was 30 at the time when she took the job. Actually, does sound pretty young now, um, but she was quite mature for her age. Um, and she um, did um, really sort of move through uh, an, an amazing career working on something she'd started at, at Rockefeller, which had to do with fibrinogen and, and the role of fibrinogen, which enters the brain through the damaged blood brain barrier and activates microglia. And she subsequently shown that it contributes to oxidative stress and lots of things related to uh, development of, of MS. She's done other work linked to microglial and astrocyte activation by neurons and basically kind of by neuronal activity, studying the neuronal um, vascular interaction. She's had continuous grant support from NIH and, and a variety of other agencies and currently has an R35 from NINDS as well as a grant from the Aging Institute. She's got a very long list of honors, um, some with um, acronyms that you will recognize from NIH. She got a PCAS award and a Eureka award. I think she got both of those while she was still at UCSD. She got the ABLE award from ASPET. She got Young Investigator Awards from at least four different international societies. And most recently, she was the Rita Levy Montalcini keynote lecturer at the International Society for Neuroimmunology. And Katerina actually managed to stay on as an adjunct faculty member in our department for a number of years. We'll get her back. <laughs> it lapsed <laughs> for reasons of uh, paperwork. Um, and now it's a pleasure to welcome her and have her here today. And I know you are all excited to hear her and will be even more excited once she finishes her talk. So thank you for joining us, Katerina. Uh, Joan, thank you so much for this very kind introduction. It's uh, such a great pleasure uh, to uh, be uh, back at the department, even for a day. And uh, um, I'm truly grateful for taking a chance on me uh, 20 years ago when uh, all this was um, uh, just an idea and uh, all the foundational work that uh, I will be presenting uh, today, it all started uh, uh, at the Department of Pharmacology at UCSD. So truly grateful for this uh, uh, support at the early days and uh, grateful to really everyone at the department for being such an amazing and collaborative uh, uh, environment for uh, a young uh, assistant professor like myself uh, that uh, started uh, this work uh, literally from scratch uh, at, uh, at, at UCSD. Um, so work uh, in my lab uh, focuses on neurovascular regulation of inflammation and tissue repair. 
And today I will be focusing on the discovery of mechanisms at the neurovascular interface and how we have harnessed uh, this information to develop uh, new imaging tools as well as also uh, therapeutics. Uh, these are my disclosures. So a common thread in neurological diseases with diverse etiologies is the leak of blood proteins into the brain. And uh, the artist of uh, this uh, painting, uh, the name of the painting is Mind of Fire. The artist is Elizabeth Jameson. She's a multiple sclerosis uh, patient uh, who is using her own MRIs uh, as inspiration to develop this uh, really beautiful uh, art. And I think that this painting, Mind on Fire, is a symbol uh, of the triggers that can set uh, the brain on fire and cause disability, uh, cognitive impairment, as well as also memory deficits. And these uh, leaks of blood in the brain are not only unique for autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, but also occur in neurodegenerative diseases. And this is three-dimensional immunolabeling in the brain of an Alzheimer's patient where you can see the blood protein fibrinogen deposited in the parenchyma of this patient. This is sustained here in red um, around uh, areas of vessels with uh, dramatic uh, 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 tortuosity um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this brain of, uh, of this Alzheimer's patient. So a driving question in my lab is uh, how do blood proteins contribute to neurological diseases? And uh, this question really started very early on uh, in my research. As a graduate student, I developed uh, 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 the first animal model that was overexpressing tumor necrosis factor in astrocytes. And this um, was the first example of a cytokine dysregulation in the brain uh, in glia cells that was sufficient to induce the whole cascade of events inducing neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration. This was really surprising at the time because it was always it was considered that it was primarily peripheral immune responses that were uh, inducing these inflammatory effects, and uh, it was surprising that that uh, CNS innate immunity activation of CNS innate immunity even in the absence of peripheral T cells when we were depleting T cells from these animals with uh, with knockout rag knockout mice we could not improve the pathology. So it was really surprising that CNS innate immunity alone uh, could be a driver of demyelination and neurodegeneration. So the uh, question that uh, I asked was, um, uh, what starts, uh, what jump starts this uh, uh, CNS innate immune activation? What are the triggers uh, that uh, could activate uh, resident innate immune cells in the brain uh, to promote this uh, um, uh, uh, deleterious uh, neurodegenerative events? And to address this question, I joined the lab of Hans Lassmann at the University of Vienna, and we performed uh, neuropathological studies to look very early on in pathogenesis, both in animal models, but also in human uh, cases of multiple sclerosis. And what we found was that blood-brain barrier disruption was one of the earliest histopathological alterations, both in animal models like the TNF transgenic mice, but also in autoimmune models that like uh, the experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis model, as well as also in human disease. And uh, it was these uh, studies that started shaping for me the question, is it possible that blood proteins, when they leak in the brain so early on, could this be the triggers of innate immune responses uh, before there is damage in the brain and before there is infiltration of immune cells? And indeed, uh, this concept of increased blood-brain barrier permeability and cerebrovascular dysfunction um, is supported by the epidemiological studies of neurological diseases with diverse etiologies like multiple sclerosis, autoimmune origin, or neurodegenerative diseases, but as well as stroke and brain trauma, where uh, it is known that uh, increased BBB permeability correlates with early disease onset as well as also worse progression in these diseases. But there has always been this chicken and the egg question. Uh, are there more blood proteins in the brain because there is more disease? Or is it possible that the leak of these blood proteins could be causal to disease pathogenesis? And in the past 20 years, in the lab, we have identified the blood coagulation factors, and in particular, the blood protein fibrinogen, as being causally linked uh, with uh, increased activation of uh, neurotoxic innate immune responses, uh, neurodegeneration, as well as also inhibition of repair. 
We have also found that this pathway is critical for the communication between peripheral nervous system with the central nervous system. And we have also found that this is a rich niche, both for the development of imaging tools, as well as also the development of therapeutics. And of course, when we started this work thinking about uh, 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 testing uh, the uh, role of blood proteins in the brain, there were many blood proteins to study. There is albumin, there is fibrinogen, uh, IgGs. The reason that we focused on fibrinogen at the time was truly hypothesis driven. And there were three key criteria that drove our hypothesis. First uh, was the evidence from human pathology. Fibrinogen was used as a marker for blood brain barrier disruption. And it was known that it is abundantly deposited in neurological diseases. And here are examples from human multiple sclerosis, traumatic brain injury, and AD, where you can see abundant fibrin deposition uh, in, uh, uh, in the brains of these uh, patients. The second aspect was the unique structure function of fibrinogen. Um, uh, Russell Doolittle at uh, UCSD has done uh, the pioneering studies on uh, uh, the crystal structure of fibrinogen. And uh, this protein has this unique feature that is a blood coagulation factor. It's soluble in the blood, but uh, at sites of BBB leaks upon the action of thrombin, it's converted to this insoluble fibrin uh, matrix, a very large polymer that has mechanotransduction properties and is persistently deposited uh, in the brain uh, at sites of BBB leaks. Uh, this conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin uh, is exposing cryptic epitopes, and one of the key cryptic epitopes that can bind immune receptors, and in particular the complement receptor 3. The third uh, aspect uh, of fibrinogen is that there were knockout mice available. So it was the first time that we could uh, 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 perform a loss of function study on a blood protein and find out if it's involved in neurological diseases. And indeed, with uh, this, uh, using these genetic tools, uh, we show that fibrin is both necessary and sufficient to induce neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration originally in the mass and then uh, also in models of AD, as well as also brain trauma. The third aspect of, the, of that, uh, of that uh, drove our hypothesis to focus on fibrinogen was that it was a druggable target. This is the gamma chain of fibrinogen, and I have highlighted the 411 uh, uh, um, uh, epitope that is the binding site to the alpha 2 beta 3 integrin receptor on platelets. And this is how our blood clots. The uh, coagulation domain of, uh, of fibrin needs to bind to the platelet receptor. Uh, this is a druggable interaction. Uh, Barry Kohler at Rockefeller has developed Theopro, a monoclonal antibody that blocks the binding of fibrin specifically to platelets. And this is manufactured by Eli Lilly as a thrombolytic. So what I noticed is that the inflammatory domain of fibrin, there was another epitope, the 377395, and this was the binding site to uh, the I domain, still even the I domain of complement receptor 3. And of course, we know that complement receptor 3 is expressed in microglia and macrophages and is a key uh, a driver for inflammation. So the question was, is it possible when this molecule finds access in the brain, is it possible that it might be hijacking uh, receptors on innate immune cells, therefore driving a potential pathogenic activation? And since these two epitopes, the coagulation epitope and the inflammatory epitope are non-overlapping, um, could we develop tools, genetic or pharmacologic, to selectively target the potential damaging inflammatory functions of fibrin without affecting its beneficial effects in blood coagulation? Um, of course, uh, the, the first order of business was to find out if this pathway played a role at all in neurological diseases. And um, in uh, 2002, uh, at, uh, when I was a postdoc fellow at the Rockefeller University, we performed the first genetic study where we used for the first time the fibrin genome couch mice in a model of, of neurological uh, disease. And what we used here was a, the first study was a trauma model of sciatic nerve injury. And we showed that the fibrinogen knockout mice were protected by having increased remyelination after sciatic nerve, nerve injury. These fibrinogen knockout mice were later used by us and many others in the field and showed protection in the GFAP, the TNF transgenic animal model, uh, EAE mice, uh, um, a chemical induced remyelination, Alzheimer's models, and uh, uh, more recently, pericyte deficient mice. 
uh, in 2007 uh, at UCSD, we collaborated with uh, uh, Jay Dickin at the University of Cincinnati, and uh, uh, we uh, utilized the fibrin genokin mouse that has a seven amino acid uh, uh, mutation only within the inflammatory domain. So this mouse makes perfectly coagulable fibrinogen. Of course, it also makes all the other blood proteins, but this fibrinogen that is made, even though it can clot, it cannot bind to the complement receptor. And this mice phenocopied a lot of the features of the fibrinogen knockout also had reduced paralysis and inflammation as well as microglia activation. Showing for the first time that the cryptic inflammatory fibrin domain could be a key driver uh, for pathogenesis uh, in uh, um, at least models of neurologic uh, disease. A uh, selective blockade of this inflammatory domain became also the basis for the development of, of, of fibrin targeting therapeutics. And uh, in my lab in, uh, at UCSD, we started by developing peptide blockers uh, where we used either intranasal or vaccination approaches uh, with peptides of this inflammatory epitope. And uh, more recently, we developed the first in class of fibrin targeting immunotherapy that uh, selectively blocks uh, the inflammatory uh, properties of fibrin with um, a, a efficacy uh, in suppressing neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration in MS and AD uh, models. Um, when we started uh, these uh, studies, uh, uh, the uh, cellular and molecular mechanisms of uh, fibrin in the brain were not identified. So we uh, thought that uh, to start dissecting the cell targets and uh, uh, the uh, molecular pathways that are activated by fibrin at uh, the neurovascular interface. Uh, the, one of the key uh, cell, cells that uh, uh, is a target fibrin is the microglia cell, and we showed that the engagement through uh, the complement receptor 3 is one of the key receptors that uh, is activated uh, uh, by uh, fibrinogen. Uh, this is inducing a, a unique signature in the microglia cells, uh, polarizing them towards both a pro-inflammatory phenotype characterized by chemokine secretion, as well as also a pro-oxidant phenotype by um, activation of NADPH oxidase and the release of the active oxygen species. Um, and this is leading in an environment that is uh, uh, promoting demyelination as well as also neurodegeneration, but also through immune mechanisms inhibition of repair. And indeed, the microglia cells are ideally positioned to receive signals from the blood vessels. On the left, you can see a schematic from the Rio Hortega that uh, developed the term of perivascular microglia. And you can see here these cells really lining up the blood vessel walls. But with the advent of in vivo to photon microscopy, we know that these uh, microglia uh, cells are very highly dynamic uh, in the brain parenchyma. And you can see here in this live uh, in vivo to photon imaging, uh, uh, constant microglia extension, uh, process extension and, uh, and, and retraction. Um, and this is a physiological function of microglia cells where they uh, constantly can extend uh, their processes uh, and perform this surveillance of the brain parenchyma uh, in physiology. So um, uh, I became very intrigued by the ability of those cells to uh, constantly move their processes, which is really unique among other uh, glia uh, in the brain. Uh, so we asked, uh, why is there this constant microglia brain surveillance uh, in the CNS? And to address this question, we developed a chemogenetic model where we uh, specifically uh, expressed in microglia the S1 subunit of pertussis toxin. This uh, uh, mouse was, uh, this study was done in collaboration with Sean Coughlin, who had uh, developed the Rosa PTX uh, S1 mouse for cell autonomous inhibition of GI uh, in cells. Uh, we crossed this mice to the microglia uh, uh, three lines. And um, uh, the, there was evidence that blockade of GPCRs uh, could reduce directed motility of microglia, could not affect surveillance. And it was always thought that there was a compensation because there are so many different uh, uh, GI-coupled receptors expressed in microglia. Uh, so we thought that if we block the GI, we could actually overcome this compensation by blocking downstream and perhaps hopefully blocking multiple GPCRs at the same time. So uh, here is the results, and on the left you can see the uh, MG wild-type mouse, this is the control, 
within an, uh, an hour, these uh, uh, cells can uh, completely survey the brain, cover the whole brain parenchyma. But you can appreciate that when we block the GI in microglia, brain surveillance is significantly impaired. And this was the first time that we could actually have microglia in the brain and we could selectively block their ability uh, to survey the brain. Uh, the effect was even more robust when we looked at uh, microglia-directed motility, and here we have done a laser ablation. You can see that even within 15 minutes, microglia very quickly respond to the site of ablation, but uh, when we block the GI, this uh, response is abolished even three hours after, um, uh, uh, after uh, imaging these cells cannot elicit a response uh, to an injury. So as we were thinking what experiments we could do with this uh, model, um, we observed that uh, some of the mice even spontaneously developed seizures. Um, we tested that, whether this, uh, this gave us the first hint that perhaps brain surveillance by microglia might be uh, uh, linked to seizures and hyperexcitability. So we tested that by actually inducing seizures in these mice by using pilocarpine, and uh, we performed EEG recordings. And uh, what you can see here was a dramatic exacerbation of seizures in the MGPTX mice. And uh, uh, when we looked at gamma power, it, the the gamma the even uh, while this uh, during the um, uh, uh, while these mice were alive during the pilocarpine model, uh, they transitioned a lot faster. And this gave us the first uh, uh, indication that microglia dynamics may be involved in uh, um, a, a increasing, uh, in uh, regulating susceptibility to seizures uh, by modulating uh, neuronal network uh, hypersynchrony. So to look into this uh, further, uh, we developed a model to be able to physiologically evoke neuronal activity in the brain uh, by using a whisker stimulation. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, stimulated the whiskers um, in awake animals, and we performed in vivo to photon imaging, simultaneously um, recording microglia dynamics. You can see the cells in green, but also using a calcium imaging probe to be able to look at neuronal activity. And what the study showed is when we evoked uh, neuronal activity, within 35 minutes, the microglia were increasing their processes and increasing surveillance at the sites of uh, increased uh, um, uh, neuronal activation. Um, in contrast, the MGPTX mice had completely lost their ability uh, to respond to physiologically evoked neuronal activity and were unable to survey the uh, uh, increase their surveillance towards the sites uh, of increased neuronal activation. And interestingly, when we recorded uh, neuronal activity from the same areas, uh, there was an increased accumulation of calcium uh, to, uh, to the areas where uh, the brain could not be surveyed by microglia uh, compared to the wild type mice where activity remained within a physiological range. And these uh, studies uh, 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 suggested that microglia not only respond to physiologically evoked neuronal activity, but they can also prevent excessive activity uh, of neuronal uh, circuits, showing for the first time that there is this potentially reciprocal uh, interaction between microglia and neuronal activity, uh, keeping uh, neuronal activation with a physiological range in the brain. Um, indeed, uh, when we looked at uh, a neuronal network firing and neuronal network bursts, uh, the uh, neuronal activity was uh, uh, highly hy hypersynchronized in the microglia PTX mouse uh, after inhibition of microglia dynamics. Um, and this correlated with very specific cell interactions between microglia and neurons. Microglia made contact uh, specifically with the evoked neurons, and this we showed it both with uh, light microscopy, but also with electron microscopy. And this is a, a wonderful study that was done um, uh, 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 with Mark Ellisman at the National Center for Microscopy and Imaging Research at UCSD, where we did a 3D reconstruction of microglia neuron uh, contacts uh, after immunization you know, labeling uh, with anti-P2Y12 antibody and SPM. And uh, what you can see here is microglia making contacts with two proximal neurons, neuron one and neuron, uh, neuron two. Um, and uh, uh, these uh, cells can also extend really large processes that can uh, uh, touch the neuronal somata even far away from the neurons. So uh, the contacts appear to be important and we decided to think whether we could de develop an experiment to try to rescue these effects. And um, uh, since uh, uh, the uh, GI uh, was one of the, the for the contact for the process extension 
we, we gathered that the cytoskeleton processes and the microglia being able to engage their cytoskeleton could be um, a, a critical aspect. So could we um, uh, restore this property of microglia in the PTX mice despite having a blocked GI? And the way we did this was by using um, an activator of raw GTP aces, um, and this is an activator of raw RAC and CDC42, and uh, that we bathed uh, here in the brain, and we performed it with photon imaging in the PTX mice. And uh, here you can see the, uh, the vehicle uh, control, and uh, this is the PTX microglia, as you can see, they cannot really survey the environment. But uh, we have a very nice increase uh, of process extension and surveillance in the presence of the raw activator. And this correlated with reduction of uh, uh, neuronal activity when we used the whisker stimulation model, suggesting that constitutive activation of raw could restore microglia motility and prevent hypersynchrony upon evoked neuronal activity. Uh, this uh, study uh, gave a new, uh, 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 said light to a new role of microglia in the adult brain uh, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, their ability to regulate uh, network synchronization within a physiological range and preventing hyperexcitability. They also proposed the MGPTX mouse as a genetic tool uh, for sustained reduction of microglia baseline surveillance, as well as also directed motility that could be used, of course, in uh, uh, different, uh, uh, in different uh, studies of microglia uh, dynamics. Um, uh, the studies also suggested that strategies to modulate microglia dynamics, uh, perhaps uh, through raw activation, may hold promise to rein in hyperactivity in neurological disorders with impaired microglia dynamics, which we know occur in Alzheimer's disease, epilepsy, um, as well as also neuroinflammatory uh, diseases. Um, and indeed, uh, microglia dynamics are significantly impaired uh, in, uh, uh, at sites of neuroinflammation. Um, in uh, this uh, study, uh, where we performed uh, uh, live imaging of uh, the blood-brain barrier uh, disruption, you can see here on the left, uh, a live imaging of, uh, um, uh, 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 with a dextran, and you can see an area of the blood vessel where there is focal leaks of the blood-brain barrier. We found that this correlated with perivascular clustering uh, of microglia cells. And these cells are amoeboid, have lost their processes, and have a distinct different motility than the cells far away from BBB uh, leaks. Um, we explored uh, whether uh, fibrinogen was involved in this perivascular clustering of microglia by crossing the microglia reporter mouse with a fibrinogen or kin mouse that does not bind to the complement receptor. And indeed, uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, genetic mutation uh, reduced perivascular clustering in this uh, 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 model of EAE, but also reduced axonal damage. And this was really the, our first indication that by blocking fibrinogen CD11B signaling in vivo uh, could be uh, 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 important for protection from neurodegeneration. Um, and show that maybe fibrinogen is not only an activator of, of, of microglia, but also an activator of uh, uh, an inducer of microglia induced neurotoxicity. So um, we thought uh, to look in further into the links between uh, fibrin and uh, uh, neuronal, neuronal damage. And to do that, we employed um, a multi probed approach where we combined longitudinal in vivo to photon imaging, um, a fibrin immunolabeling with IDISCO in cleared human and mouse brains, um, as well as also cognitive behavioral tests in animal models of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, these studies were performed in the 5XFAD uh, animal model of AD. And here we have performed endogenous labeling of fibrinogen, you can see it in red, uh, a beta plaques as well as dendrites. And you can appreciate these very highly dystrophic uh, dendrites around the A-beta plaques. This is well established in the field, has been shown by David Holtzman, Wimby Algan, and others. But what we noticed is that there were also fibrin deposits far away from the amyloid plaques that also showed signs of uh, dystrophy, of neurite dystrophy around these fibrin deposits. So was it possible that uh, a fibrin entrance in the brain could be uh, also a trigger uh, for dystrophic, for dystrophic neurites in neurodegeneration? So we performed longitudinal in vivo, uh, longitudinal in vivo to photon imaging in the 5XFAD mice using this labeling system. And uh, uh, we looked into spine turnover 
uh, to be able to find if the spines, which are the main sites for uh, synapse formation, if uh, there is spinal elimination uh, around sites of fibrin deposits. And here you can see with this quantification, now uh, you can see that our positive control was the amyloid plaque. And indeed over 14 days, so this is baseline imaging, we can go and find the same area. And two weeks later, we can quantify, uh, quantify uh, spines uh, around this uh, plaque. And you can see that there is a dramatic uh, uh, decrease of spines uh, around amyloid plaques as expected. But what was interesting is that there was also spine elimination around fibrin plaques, including uh, uh, those fibrin deposits that were not proximal to amyloid. And when we looked at areas with no deposits at all, again, as expected, the spines are pretty stable. So uh, these uh, studies uh, showed that uh, uh, fibrin deposits uh, in the brain, the 5-HFAD mice, can also be uh, sites of spinal elimination, even independent of amyloid. Uh, we crossed the 5-HFAD animal with the fibrinogen mutant, and uh, uh, these uh, uh, mice were protected from several uh, features of neurodegeneration with characterized with different markers. But I think what was uh, really uh, interesting is uh, the, uh, beh the uh, behavioral tests, and we performed uh, uh, memory and learning behavioral tests, including active place avoidance and also open field activity. And uh, you can see that uh, the five HFAD mice at 10 months of age uh, are uh, rescued from uh, uh, this memory deficit in uh, the active avoidance test. And in the open field test, uh, they're, they're rescued from the uh, hyperactivity that characterizes this, uh, 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 this uh, AD um, uh, line. So collectively, these uh, studies identified fibrinogen as a new culprit of spine elimination and cognitive decline at sites of vascular damage. Um, they showed that fibrin is an optical signal uh, that induces oxidative stress and neurotoxic in immune responses at the neurovascular interface. I didn't show this data, but the blockade of uh, NADPH oxidase could rescue the effect of fibrin on spinal elimination. And uh, they also provided this mechanistic link to this emerging concepts in the field about cerebrovascular pathology being an independent mechanism uh, that drives neurodegeneration and cognitive impairment. And uh, these, uh, I think, concepts come both from uh, 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 multiple sclerosis, but also Alzheimer's disease. So this uh, is a study that uh, was done in our department by Sergio Baranzini, and it's the first uh, um, whole genome sequencing of two twin sisters, uh, one with the multiple sclerosis and the other without. And this uh, study failed to find any genetic or epigenetic differences between those two sisters. They both had the same uh, susceptibility genes uh, to develop uh, MS, but one developed it and the other didn't. And the authors concluded that there has to be some trigger that can cause one to develop it and the other not. And the way that we're thinking of BBB disruption is um, as a trigger, an amplifier for neurological diseases uh, in susceptible, uh, genetically susceptible individuals, especially in the context of autoimmune um, neurological diseases. Um, there is also strong evidence uh, about the concept of cerebrovascular pathology in human disease from Alzheimer's disease, um, where it is known that uh, cerebrovascular pathology is an early, independent, and additive predictor of cognitive decline. Uh, here you can see data from uh, the ADNI uh, database of over a thousand subjects with Alzheimer's disease, and vascular pathology is one of the, is the earliest uh, manifestation in AD patients, uh, starting as early as uh, a mild cognitive impairment, and in many cases predictive of conversion of mild cognitive impairment to AD. Um, in elderly, this, uh, these are not AD patients, but elderly uh, over the age of 76, um, uh, they, they, this study performed longitudinal cognitive trajectories over a five-year period and showed that uh, a vascular pathology uh, or uh, amyloid uh, were uh, equal predictors of cognitive decline uh, over five years. And the uh, uh, elderly uh, patients who had uh, both amyloid and vascular pathology, the effect was additive, it was a lot worse cognitively over a five-year period. Those who had none were pretty stable. Uh, this uh, study was performed at Mayo and was later replicated uh, with the similar results uh, at the Harvard Aging Study. 
Uh, more recently, uh, Berislav Zlokovic's uh, group uh, uh, showed that APOE4, the leading genetic risk factor in Alzheimer's disease, is associated with blood brain barrier disruption in AD. And these are data from this study that identified fibrinogen levels in the cerebrospinal fluid uh, of uh, AD patients uh, that uh, correlate uh, with uh, the APOE4 uh, uh, genotype as well as also CSF detection of soluble PTGF receptor beta and established marker for, um, uh, uh, for BBB uh, 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 disruption. So these uh, studies uh, combined from mouse and human disease uh, uh, suggest that uh, um, a targeting vascular uh, induced inflammation and neurodegeneration could be um, a, an interesting therapeutic area to explore. So to be able to add to the toolbox of therapeutics for neurological diseases, uh, um, uh, drugs that can neutralize vascular, driven, vascular induced toxicity. Um, at the same time though, of course, if these are such complex processes at the neurovascular interface. So one cannot stop but wondering, would targeting a single molecule uh, be enough? So as I was thinking about this question, um, I was very inspired by the, um, uh, when I read the autobiography of Jan Dilczek. Jan Dilczek is the um, inventor of uh, Remicade, the first anti-TNF therapeutic, which of course we know is one of the most successful drugs for rheumatoid arthritis and many other autoimmune diseases. But what uh, Dr. Wiltzek says in uh, his autobiography is that in the early 90s, to most scientists and physicians, it seemed inconceivable that blocking a single cytokine could be beneficial for rheumatoid arthritis patients when it was known that multiple cytokines are involved in the inflammatory process. And um, when we hear uh, Napoleon Ferrara talk about the story of VGFs as a similar story, it seemed uh, inconceivable that blocking a single angiogenic factor uh, could uh, actually have therapeutic benefit. But um, it seems that uh, when uh, there are pathways that are necessary and sufficient to mediate a, a biological process, maybe it's worthwhile pursuing whether developing an efficacious drug um, might have a therapeutic effect. So with that in mind, uh, we uh, decided to develop uh, a fibrin targeting uh, immunotherapy um, to selectively neutralize the toxic inflammatory functions of fibrin in the brain. And uh, the uh, a challenge that uh, we, um, we had was that fibrin had both a very protective function, which is hemostasis. And of course, we didn't want to uh, uh, have any adverse effects by blocking coagulation properties of fibrin. Um, and we wanted to develop a drug to be, to be able to selectively separate and selectively target the inflammatory function without affecting the coagulation uh, function of the, uh, of, of the molecule. And the way we achieved that was by developing epitope-specific antibodies that can target only the cryptic inflammatory fibrin domain that is exposed in the pathogenic molecule and is not present in the soluble fibrinogen. Uh, this was a, 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 a large study that uh, uh, between Gladstone, UC San Diego, as well as UCSF, and the antibodies uh, were made where, when, where, when I was uh, at the Department of Pharmacology in, uh, 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 in, at UCSD. Uh, the antibodies that we uh, developed uh, were, uh, had this unique property to be able to selectively target the inflammatory functions of fibrin by targeting the cryptic epitope. And these antibodies did not show adverse anticoagulant effects. And uh, when we tested these antibodies in animal models, we tested them in four different models of MS. Um, they have the potent therapeutic effects by blocking relapses. You can see it here in this therapeutic administration. Um, but also in therapeutic administration in models of Alzheimer's disease. And here we have done a reversal uh, therapy. We administered the antibody at three and a half months of age in the 5 x of ADIM animals. And you can see increase of cholinergic neurons, but also suppression of inflammatory networks uh, in the cortex of these uh, animals, many of which correlate with genes that we know are important from human uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is an example of the complement network that is being done regulated uh, by uh, the antibody. Um, uh, suggesting that the fibrin targeting immunotherapy uh, could be uh, considered as a tool uh, for as a therapy uh, as a tool to suppress uh, this uh, um, uh, to be able to neutralize uh, fibrin in neurologic uh, diseases. 
uh, this uh, uh, study was recently uh, featured in uh, the 20th anniversary issue of Nature Immunology. And uh, we had the opportunity to uh, discuss how we connected the dots from this uh, like really uh, uh, a curiosity to find out how blood proteins uh, affect the brain uh, to developing uh, a proof of principle tool uh, to block uh, vascular induced innate immune driven neurodegeneration. Uh, this uh, study is also um, um, uh, opened uh, for me a, a question about uh, something that was always coming up to our day on in our data was this uh, prooxidant function of fibrin and the identification of uh, uh, of uh, in uh, transcriptomic or proteomic studies of uh, uh, genes associated with oxidative stress. And um, uh, um, I became intrigued about uh, how little we understood, at least in the brain, the links between innate immunity, uh, mechanistic links, uh, oxidative stress production, and neurodegeneration. So we thought uh, to focus this uh, in uh, three uh, questions, which uh, were, what is the transcriptomic landscape of oxidative stress producing innate immune cells? What are the signals that can polarize innate immune cells towards oxidative stress production? And are there drugs that can selectively target a neurotoxic innate immunity? So to address uh, these questions, uh, we uh, uh, developed a, a blood-brain barrier and immunity multiomics analysis pipeline together with uh, uh, collaborators at uh, Gladstone and UCSF that combined single cell transcriptomics, postoproteomics, as well as also computational methods for data integration and validation. And this is one of the first studies uh, from this uh, uh, work uh, where we, what you can see here is uh, uh, we developed a functional transcriptomics uh, platform combined with drug discovery. And uh, we developed toxic for single cell RNA seq profiling of uh, ROS producing uh, cells. Um, using uh, toxic, uh, we reported the first oxidative stress in eight immune cell atlas. And we integrated these signatures also with human signatures to be able to identify human relevant genes that might uh, be important contributors to oxidative stress. We combine these approaches with high throughput screen of uh, small molecule libraries. And uh, we um, uh, developed uh, innate immune uh, inhibitors with potential of neuro or for neuroprotective uh, strategies. Uh, this uh, uh, platform uh, was uh, used in the EAE animal model of multiple sclerosis, but of course it can be used for any tissue that uh, is, uh, um, uh, has innate immune cells and uh, that secrete uh, 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 ROS. So these are the results from this uh, uh, study. And uh, uh, here what you can see uh, is the oxidative stress uh, cell atlas in the EAE MS model. And uh, what uh, we observed is that the, there were transcriptionally distinct uh, cell populations in EAE, uh, highlighted here in red, that were the co contributing to ROS release. And interestingly, these were transcriptionally distinct from other inflammatory populations that you can see here in black, and of course distinct from the healthy cells uh, here in gray. Uh, these ROS producing cells uh, were both monocyte, uh, from monocyte uh, macrophage populations. Uh, several of them were ROS secretors. But there was also one microglia population, the population five, that was enriched in the ROS signature. And even though these cells, monocytes, and uh, macrophages and microglia have, are of different origin, they appear to share a core oxidative stress signature. And this signature was characterized by oxidative stress genes, uh, glutathione genes, but also uh, a production of also coagulation genes. We performed a sub subcluster analysis for this uh, data. And indeed, we identified the specific subpopulations. Here you can see the MG5 and the MP1 that were enriched in the oxidative stress uh, uh, pathways with GO analysis while other populations like MG3 and MP3 uh, were enriched for antigen presentation. And uh, this uh, uh, result suggested that there is a functional heterogeneity of CNS innate immune cells in relation to oxidative stress with specific populations dedicated perhaps to, towards oxidative stress production and antigen presentation. So we verified this uh, single cell RNA-seq data with bulk seq on fact sorted microglia and macrophages. And uh, this is network uh, uh, pathway network analysis from, from the bulk seq data, where there was a positive microglia, where it had pathways enriched for phosphorylation, blood coagulation, as well as lipid biosynthesis that includes glutathione genes, like, for example, GGT5. 
Uh, the rose microglia had downregulated uh, pathways of general inflammatory response, leukocyte activation, as well as also antigen presenting markers. So these uh, studies uh, identified, uh, I think, uh, several uh, interesting uh, genes to, to, to study, but uh, um, uh, it was uh, uh, not so simple to uh, prioritize uh, these genes for potential druggable targets. So to do that, uh, we um, uh, uh, decided to perform a high throughput, high content screen on primary microglia by using either fibrin uh, or LPS for the induction. We screened about uh, 2,000 small molecules. Um, and uh, from this uh, uh, analysis, we identified um, about 100 small molecules that uh, could uh, uh, suppress uh, uh, either fibrin-induced or LPS-induced activation of microglia. The study was done in collaboration with Michelle Arkin at the UCSF Small Molecule Discovery Center, and the library was primarily FDA-approved compounds and bioactive compounds. So because uh, the, the target of these compounds was known, we performed keg analysis, and uh, with keg analysis, we performed drug networks, and we overlaid these drug networks with the results we got from the toxic analysis of the uh, gene expression in the oxidative stress populations. And this, or with this overlay of drug gene network uh, overlays, we could prioritize now uh, which uh, genes had also come up in the high throughput screen and identify drugs that had a higher potential to block these oxidative stress pathways. And these were the drugs that we, pro, pro, that we put forward for in vivo validation, and we tested them either in chronic MS models or neurodegenerative models. So one of the key uh, targets that was uh, identified through this uh, drug gene network overlays was GGT, gamma glutamate transferase. Uh, GGT is a plasma membrane ectoenzyme that degrades the antioxidant glutathione, uh, which of course uh, is uh, uh, important for uh, oxidative stress regulation. Um, toxic analysis had identified glutathione regulating genes in the ROS positive microglia and macrophages, and these genes were also present in human MS uh, signatures. Uh, GGT has been studied extensively in cancer, uh, but uh, hasn't, hadn't been studied in the context of neuroinflammation. But there was evidence uh, about GGT being a biomarker uh, increased in the serum in multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, as well as also Alzheimer's disease, where it was shown to correlate with clinical disability, BBB disruption, dementia risk, and inflammation. So we decided to perform the first studies of GGT expression, and indeed we found that GGT was expressed in, in neuroinflammatory uh, lesions in the EAE animal. So we used the drug Acivisin. This had been identified in our high throughput screen and is an inhibitor of GGT. And when we dosed the animals with the GGT inhibitor, we used here a chronic EAE model. This is the NOD uh, uh, model of EAE. We let the, the mice get sick for 80 days, so we did a very late administration. And even at this late uh, uh, onset of drug uh, delivery, we could see that there was a, a, a decrease of clinical scores in these mice that was associated with decrease of NADPH oxidase in the spinal cord, decrease of demyelination, as well as also decrease of axonal damage. Uh, showing that the therapeutic administration of, of this GGT inhibitor uh, could protect uh, from uh, uh, chronic uh, neuroinflammatory uh, disease. So these uh, studies overall, I think, have uh, expanded the way we think about uh, a, a vascular, cerebrovascular-driven uh, inflammation um, by introducing the concept that uh, there are specialized uh, immune populations like the microglia uh, MG5 uh, cells uh, that are polarized towards oxidative stress production. And uh, this uh, uh, polarization is also inducing in situ production of coagulation genes that uh, can be inducing this uh, uh, vicious uh, cycle of increased oxidative stress, further promoting uh, vascular induced uh, neurotoxicity. Um, we also, uh, uh, these studies have also identified uh, ways to intervene uh, with this pathway, either upstream by blocking the uh, fibrinogen interaction with its receptors, or downstream uh, by identifying now selective pathways that cannot be activated in these uh, um, uh, 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 ROS secreting innate immune cells like GGT uh, for the potential development of selective inactivation of innate immune populations, uh, because clearly there are uh, 
uh, innate immunity has many beneficial effects in removing uh, debris, protection from infection. So it would be important to be able to identify these pathways for selective inactivation of neurotoxic uh, uh, innate immune populations. And this, uh, of course, would be uh, applicable uh, in different neurological conditions. So I discussed uh, uh, the role of uh, fibrin in uh, neuroinflammation, but I also want to remind you uh, that the fibrin is also an important inhibitor of repair and myelination. Um, this, uh, the take-home message from these studies was very nicely captured in these news and views, describing fibrin as a bloody break on uh, uh, myelin repair. And I want to remind you that it's a bloody break on repair, but also a gas, a gas pedal uh, for toxic uh, inflammation. Uh, fibrin is uh, uh, the mechanism of uh, fibrin inhibition of uh, remyelination is both immune driven, so macrophage uh, and uh, um, uh, immune activation of, uh, uh, of fibrinogen would, can uh, uh, block remyelination, but it's also direct. And uh, what we showed is that the fibrinogen can activate BMP receptor signaling in oligodendrocyte precursor cells, also neuronal progenitors, and induce a cell fate switch where these progenitor cells, instead of becoming their desired fate, like mature oligodendrocytes, switch their cell fate towards uh, astrocytes. And here you can see in vitro when we treat an OPC culture with fibrinogen, you can see that this culture turns into uh, astrocytes. And these studies have been done with sulfate mapped um, uh, 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 cells in vitro and in vivo. Um, this uh, property of uh, fibrinogen to be an extrinsic inhibitor of remyelination could also be important for therapies. Uh, we recently showed that uh, non-promyelinating drugs, many of which are now in clinical trials, uh, are actually uh, uh, the differentiation of uh, the abortive opiate differentiation by fibrinogen is refractory to these non-promyelinating drugs. So they cannot overcome extrinsic inhibition uh, at sites of lesions. Um, the good news is that uh, blockade of BMP receptor signaling uh, can actually overcome this fibrinogen inhibition and might be um, uh, therapeutically desirable uh, when uh, there is uh, um, a, for promoting repair uh, at sites of uh, blood brain barrier uh, leaks. Uh, so overall, where I think the, the, the field starts, stands now, uh, there is extensive now preclinical validation of this pathway in animal models of neurological diseases by multiple labs. And uh, of course, I want to remind you that fibrin is a global activator of the innate immune response also in the periphery. And indeed, uh, uh, other studies have shown its role in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, colitis, NASH, and models of periodontitis. Uh, currently, this uh, concept is expanded. There are many uh, animal models and the human diseases that uh, I think provide the rationale uh, to study this uh, further, uh, this extent from models of trauma, epilepsy, but also psychiatric diseases. And there is evidence of the presence of fibrin in both uh, schizophrenia as well as also bipolar uh, disorder. Um, my lab focuses more on mechanistic and cellular uh, mechanisms of this uh, of, 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 of functions in the brain, and we take advantage now of multiomic approaches to be able to do unbiased experiments in uh, um, dissecting the molecular the, 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 the molecular uh, mechanisms at the neurovascular interface. Um, there is, of course, a lot of potential for drug discovery. I, pre I presented the fibrin immunotherapy, but I'm sure one can envision many ways to intervene with this pathway, including also protecting the BBB in the first place, uh, so to not allow uh, these toxic molecules uh, to enter uh, in the CNS. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, will be a hypothesis until it can be tested in the clinic with safety and uh, efficacious tools um, of uh, uh, fibrin selective in inhibitors and uh, 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 clinical trials uh, with robust, uh, I think, patient stratification, fluid biomarkers, GWAS uh, studies, as well as brain imaging. Um, these uh, studies have also contributed to the emerging concept of neurovascular brain immunology, of studying neurological diseases uh, through the multidisciplinary lenses of vascular biology, hematology, immunology, and neuroscience, um, as uh, a, a critical uh, 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 intersection for discovering fundamental mechanisms for neurological diseases and developing novel imaging tools, biomarkers, animal models, uh, and therapies. And as we're developing all these uh, tools and data, I think it's important to think about also how we can share them. And uh, uh, the data I presented today are available open access. Uh, there is a shiny uh, app uh, with uh, the oxidative stress uh, cell atlas. Um, we have developed uh, a comprehensive oxidative stress and redox pathway that we have de deposited on the wiki pathways. And all the microglia inhibitors from the screen are available on the Nature Immunology website.
Um, we're also uh, setting up an access and imaging protocols, either through uh, a, a dedicated journals uh, for this purpose or video protocols. And uh, um, uh, we're grateful for NICMAR uh, that has the publicly available cell image library uh, where we can deposit raw images and also larger uh, videos from our papers. And of course, uh, uh, sharing takes time. And sometimes the easiest thing to do is to just upload protocols on your website. So we uh, have a specific tab on our lab's website uh, with uh, our, the most uh, high demand protocols for uh, the lab. So I would like to thank the extremely talented people in my lab that have done this work. Uh, the TOXIC protocol was developed by Andrew Mendiola and uh, the studies on GGT and Civicin were performed by Jay Ryu, uh, who also together with Anka Mary Franke led the studies on the fiber immunotherapy. Um, Mark Peterson and Resmit Ognada uh, work on the inhibition of demyelination studies. Uh, Zio Chi Yan is working on Alzheimer's disease. And Renaud Shuk and uh, Yu Yong on our microglia imaging. And Alif Sosman and Karuna Dixit are doing some uh, wonderful work on uh, fibrin uh, 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 structure function and interactions. Um, the, uh, I would like to thank all the collaborators over the years. Uh, clearly, this is a very multidisciplinary program, and I would never have been able to do this without these incredible uh, people who contributed resources, ideas, and uh, supported uh, these uh, studies uh, throughout uh, the years. Um, truly grateful for all the past trainees, uh, many of which you might recognize from, uh, from, UCSF, from UCSD and UCSF uh, that uh, really spearheaded these uh, uh, studies. And uh, thank you for thank to all the funders that have funded the work over the years. And thank you all so much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful talk, Katerina. Um, uh, Janine, uh, do you see questions in the Q and A's and we can call on people? Let me just ask a question while we're getting them, Katerina. So explain to me the sort of temp in, in neurodegenerative disease, the temporal relationship between breakdown of the blood brain barrier, which has to happen for the fibrinogen toxicity and then the, the microglial activation and so on. Is there anything that happens in reverse is you somehow get a little bit of fibrin fibrinogen that then you know kind of contributes to the breakdown or is it a somewhat later event uh no this this is an excellent question and it appears that getting a little bit of fiber in the brain is accelerating this effect because uh once this uh, um original response happens so primarily i think microglia are the key ones then there are interactions with multiple cells and this can be with neurons can be with endothelial cells um, and there is also evidence uh, that at least in vitro, uh, fibrin alone can also uh, act on endothelial cells, decreasing tight junctions. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the receptors that fibrin can bind to, I didn't talk about other receptors that can bind to fibrin, uh, CDLA-B is not the only one, uh, is VEC adherin. Um, and binding of fibrin to, to VEC adherin could also be important uh, uh, for uh, um, endothelial barriers. Uh, so uh, yes, I think that your 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 insight is correct that uh, by blocking fibrinogen, you're also protecting from further BBB leaks. Uh -huh. Great, thank you, um, Silvio. Is uh, question Silvio? Want to ask your question, Silvio? Uh, I see. I see the question. Maybe I can read it. Uh, uh, Silvio, thank you for your question. I would love to talk to you about this. Uh, wh what are candidate GI GPCRs involved in microglia mediating brain hyperexcitability? So this is this is an excellent question, and there are studies that have been done, you know, for P two Y twelve, and P two Y twelve has a transient effect in uh, in uh, stopping microglia directed motility. Uh, the microglia recovers, so it's not as as profound as the PTX mice. Has no effect on surveillance. So to date, there hasn't been a single GPCR that can have the effect of, of the PTX mice. But um, I just was discussing before with Joan, it would be so exciting to be able to look at uh, 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 other uh, you know, chemogenetic ways to be able to uh, intervene with uh, GI, either by increasing it or shutting it down. So, so that's um, uh, really an excellent question. So but can you imagine also doing the opposite with the GS couple receptors? Uh, yes, exactly. So I think there is. I think this uh, this approach that we started with uh, 
this, uh, this is, you know, we, this was the first chemogenetic approach on microglia to interfere with the GI. I think now this is really open with uh, either existing uh, transgenic animal models to interfere with uh, uh, GS, GI, uh, uh, RO, uh, upstream or downstream. It would be really exciting to be able to do these studies or develop new models if we don't have the ones we need. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess sort of relevant to what Silvio is asking is, do you have any clue whether that sort of GI stuff has to do with, and we know that beta gamma is involved in activation of the small GTPases or with GI inhibition of cyclase where, you know, Silvio's question is, would sort of GS do the opposite? Do you have any idea what the downstream of GI signaling is in, in that case? Um, Unfortunately, we haven't looked into that. I, I, I don't know exactly the specifics, and that could be, you know, a really interesting mechanism to dissect. This pertussis toxin, you know, would block both um, the, the beta gamma availability and G alpha availability. Exactly. There are, there are tools to block the beta gamma part. Exactly, exactly. So we took the, you know, we, we used pertussis toxin because nothing else before had been able to block the surveillance. Yeah. So we thought to start with the least specific approach uh, and see if anything would work at all. So now that I think we have for the first time an effect, uh, I think that that's important to look into that further. I think Mark has a question. He has an incredible background as well. Mark, where, just where are you? <laughs> well, what that's that? in Myanmar. It's a gold uh, gilded uh, Buddha. But it's uh, hi, hi, Mark. Mark is my partner in crime. So everything, everything, everything I showed you is uh, ideas I have been bouncing back and forth with Mark for the past. I don't even know how many years. I've stopped counting, Mark. Well, yeah, you're somebody who. I enjoy talking to as often as we have time. Um, my question is really quite simple. Um, kind of riffs off of Joan's comment, uh, the potential bidirectionality of mm -hmm. transport between the brain and the blood. And once fibrin uh, or fibrinogen is created fibrin and it becomes perivascular, I'm wondering uh, what you think about the normal process, I'm not talking about glial lymphatics, but of astrocyte or microglial clearance of amyloid, since we're into Alzheimer's now quite a bit. Once you begin to have vascular compromises and fibrin deposition, the extent to which you think we're also impeding the exit of normal material, which has a circadian cadence like amyloid, uh, from the brain. This is another worry that I have about yes. when we see amyloid ac accumulation, how much of it is just stalled clearance. Yes, so a concern with most anti-microglia uh, therapies is that there is increased accumulation of amyloid because these, uh, uh, if you block microglia activation, you block phagocytosis, and then these cells cannot phagocytose amyloid. So you end up with more amyloid deposition in CAA. Um, in contrast, because I think by, we don't block microglia, we block one ligand that activates microglia. In these models, either the genetic that I showed or the uh, antibody, there is no difference in amyloid deposits in the brain. So there is, and this is what is really interesting that even though amyloid stays the same, there is this robust protection from the cognitive uh, deficits or the downregulation of the inflammatory pathways. And I think this is a big advantage of blocking a ligand of the cells, uh, because like this, we don't seem to be affecting their ability to uptake amyloid. So amyloid is neither more or less, it stays the same uh, after fibrinogen blockade, but you still get the therapeutic effect of, uh, um, of uh, um, uh, intercognitive impairment. This is no different than blocking tau. So the tau knockouts, for example, have same levels of, of amyloid in the brain, but they're protected from the from the cognitive deficits. Yeah. Well, this this can be saved for one of our Mark and Katarina discussions. But there should be a difference if you had animals that were Christchurch APOE substitution versus uh, one of the more worrisome APOEs. You should yes. see a difference in the exit uh, because the APOE protects against. It prevents the tau accumulation while leaving the amyloid less harmful. 
excellent, excellent idea. And also, uh, uh, there are also, of course, soluble uh, species of amyloid, that, that, the toxic ones, and we have not tested that. Yeah. So that's also something important to test if we have any differences in the soluble species. Yeah. So I Wonderful think talk. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you so much, Mark. Okay, Paul is here. Paul, you have a question you want to ask? Yeah, hi, Katerina. It's great to see you. A wonderful talk. Um, I had a kind of a question that surprised me that um, you didn't mention, and I thought, I wonder if this has been tested, whether uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, is associated with this. It would seem obvious that that ought to be looked at for the mechanisms that you're describing. Has that been done? Are you doing that? Somebody uh, doing it, that? It seems it like has it would be no, it has not, It has not been done. It was on my slide about the potential other diseases. CTE is one of them. Uh, uh, because indeed, there is there are BBB leaks. No one has characterized the, the material for fibrinogen uh, yet. Uh, we have done some studies in traumatic brain injury uh, that there is a fibrin deposition. But this is exactly you know, the type of studies we have developed this fibrinogen toolbox, and we're happy to share it with everyone who has the models available and is an expert in those models uh, to be able to test if this is also the same in other models of disease. CT would be a fantastic candidate. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. Okay, thanks. Okay, Susan, you have a question? You're, you're muted. Susan, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Okay, I mean, that was a great talk, Katerina, really nice. And I'm looking forward to talking more this afternoon. What about mitochondria? You didn't mention mitochondria one time in your whole I, I talk. know, I know. We haven't, I, I didn't mention them because we haven't studied them. Uh, but of course, you know, I completely agree that it makes a lot of sense for us to be able to look into the effects of mitochondria. Unfortunately, we haven't done any studies uh, on mitochondria and fiber. Okay. And, and I'm related to that question now. Uh, do you know if the ROS generation in those cells that you're looking at is coming from mitochondria? Because the you know the cells may differ in terms of their yes. Vitamin. So so th this is an excellent question. So uh, the probe that we use uh, labels all of raw species. It doesn't differentiate. Right. Um, but the protocol can be expanded uh, to be able to identify specific raw species. So ah. this uh, and this is something one of the ways that we're thinking of expanding the toxic to be able to use more specific probes. Um, and be able to find specific uh, uh, cells of specific reactive oxygen species or mitochondria, uh, probes that can label mitochondria. So the, the protocol does have that potential and it would be great to be expanded towards this direction uh, because this can also, I think, dissect further the subpopulation of innate immune cells uh, for um, uh, ROS release. Right, right, right. All right, well, if there's no further questions, I will let the students have the opportunity to interact with Katerina. Um, wish you were here. It was great seeing you. That was a wonderful talk and thank you so much. Thank so you all so much. Thank you.